you start to see this cliche and it's actually your life. We're a not very successful weirdo rock group and we're just like every other group, you know, we're gonna get dropped from our record label. We, we've had, uh, you know, one hit single, you know, and our main musician, our genius musician is also a heroin addict, you know. And you could just look ahead and be like, how do you think this is gonna work out? They signed Warners in basically 1990. You know, bands were getting signed that was you know, you know, very similar in style, you know, in the alternative kind of world. The first album on Warner Brothers was Hit to Death in the Future Head. And then they, they put out Transmissions from a Satellite Heart. You know, another great record and it had the single, She Don't Use Jelly, on it. I remember driving around in a van with Mercury Rev and somebody had leaked us a, a six songs from what was going to be transmissions. And we were all just listening to songs, like, yeah, it's cool, that's cool, that's cool. And then, you know, She Don't Use Jelly came out, I was like, holy crap, they actually wrote a song. Like, they could, they could do something here. Suddenly we found this great rock sound and you know that this was going to be the group and we were going to you know i suppose at that time we we thought we could make 20 records like that or whatever you know jelly became a hit and we ended up selling a few hundred thousand records and you know in the scheme of things back then it still wasn't a huge amount of records but it was enough to let warner brothers know that there's something here when we hit transmissions and it blew up and sold a whole bunch of records and we had a hit and all that sort of stuff. And we thought, all right, now we're in. And then we put out Cloud Stays Metallic. And it went right back to however many records we had sold before. Well, I think it ended up doing around 36,000 records, which would have been deemed what we call in the record industry a failure. It was the first and only time, I think, that I, I, somebody from a record company said to me, oh, we really dropped the ball on that. <laughs> which I, I was a stunning admission. Warner Brothers, I, I think they were looking for things to drop around that time period. I don't know how much we'd said it openly, but I think we knew that we were buying time. And then, you know, in the summer of 96, as everything was changing and it seemed like, you know, whatever the alternative nation and grunge and all that stuff, it seemed like that was on oh, its last dying legs, you know, um, you know, Ronald, our guitar player, quit. You know, Ronald Jones was this, uh, he was an incredible guitar player. He could play any kind of guitar, but the stuff he chose to play was, um, it's like a, it was like a cross between, you know, electric Miles Davis and Kevin Shields or something. He had a really unique um, approach to guitar and it really helped define those two records for us, you know. So when he left, it was almost like, well, we can't really get anybody that can replace him. So what are we gonna do? That left a huge hole. Um, psychologically and musically into what the hell are the Flaming Lips anymore? I have to admit, there was a part of me that was relieved that, well, if he leaves, then we don't have to continue on in that rock group way. And Ronald leaving um, gave me this great excuse to be like, hey, why don't we just do something completely absurd? which is where the parking lot experiments came from. The test begin, the test begin, the test begin now. Is this sort of a grab? 
of all the cars in the parking lot, and everybody turns their tape decks on at the same time, and um, whatever I put on the tapes comes out of it. When it first was going on, I was like, I, I don't know what's going on here. We kind of just got out of the line of sight of, of anyone at Warner Brothers. I mean, we stopped asking for money and started doing these other, you know, boombox shows and experiments and things like that. Joe, you can get that louder, number 16. It, it made everything seem possible, not just music, but sounds and, 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 and atmospheres, and everything became possible, instead of it just being rock, you know. And so, this idea of turning these parking lot experiments into something kind of like that on a record, I mean, that had a lot of inertia of like, let's do that because it's cool, you know. And then you get in there and you really have no idea how you're going to do it. Um, hello again, everybody. Just if you, you walked in late, I'm Wayne from the band The Flaming Lips, and we are doing this Zarika party. Uh, people who are manning the CD players, um, get ready. <laughs> One, two, three, four, go! <laughs> Talking about how to record the boombox experiments turned into Zyrica. And we had decided we're gonna approach it like basically like normal music, but we're gonna have it in this extended bizarre surround sound version. You know, Wayne came up with the idea of, you know, the Zyrica album and it's four disc, you're supposed to play all at once. But I think originally Wayne wanted to do a hundred CDs, I think was what he talked about. And then Scott was like, you're fucking crazy, man. I got him down to four. I really thought every group would start to make music like that. You know, and they would do six CDs or 10 and we just looked like wimps who were doing four. It became apparent that it was gonna cost an unbelievable amount of money to go to a, any recording studio that could handle it, technically handle what we needed to do. And it's gonna take an indeterminate amount of time since we have no freaking idea what it's gonna sound like. Um, so we decided to build a studio instead. I think we always feel like it's kind of our place too, in a way. They were the first client. We got the board on like a, a Friday. We started the session on a, on a Tuesday or something. He was still like nailing stuff in the floor and getting the wires plugged in. I think uh, the headphone outs weren't even hooked up yet. We didn't know anything about what the studio could or would or should sound like. We had no idea what was going to happen. But it was just totally hit the ground running. Here we go. The hardest part of Zyrica, I mean, for them was recording it. For me, was getting Warner Brothers to put it out, you know. I think the way he put it to them was that if you let these guys do this crazy record, they'll do this crazy record and their next proper record on one budget, which is what we did. People don't understand how closely related Zyrica and the Saw Bulletin were. I mean, those records were recorded simultaneously. Some of the stock and trade kind of stuff that you would normally do to make a rock song. We talked about jettisoning. This idea that we would not do the big or orchestrated guitar stuff that we were doing, it almost became a little bit of a rule. It's sort of like, man, sure wish I could play guitar now. It's like, but dude, you can't, because we, <laughs> we made the rule, you know? No ice cream for three weeks, you, that's the rule. You know, no guitars for a couple of songs. 
we're gonna have to figure out some other way to get that emotional impact, to get that visceral impact coming out of the speakers and communicate this feeling, but not like that. Well, if we can't have Ronald Jones, then we're not gonna fucking have anybody. You know, we're not gonna have any guitar. We're just gonna go the other way, you know. But not, you know, craft work the other way. We're gonna go like Disney soundtracks the other way. We'd always played around with orchestral-ish stuff, but it's like, well, we can actually play. And then technology caught up. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. We couldn't commit to a part until the song was done. So we'd write something and then it'd be like, well, that's cool. Um, you'd work on it for a couple days and what if everything was totally different? Okay, well, let's change everything. And you can't do that with an orchestra. I mean, uh, we can't do it with an orchestra. We can't write it quick enough. We can't conceive it quick enough. And we don't have the time to sit around and wait for it. So, um, MIDI, yeah. You have to remember that an orchestra is never perfectly in tune. So we figured out if we detune these keyboards from one another, that would help achieve like this sort of, this sound that didn't sound as phony as just plugging a keyboard in and playing the horn lines. But at the time, we, you know, I wanted to imagine there was a big orchestra playing. And he would do orchestration just sitting there. And he's going, wow, man, that, that already sounds awesome. It was a gargantuan task to work on some of those songs. But it was also great because we were hearing things for the first time we'd never heard anybody do before. I made a compilation tape. Back then we listened to cassette tapes on the way up to the studio. And I made a tape that was full of things using subtle orchestration and changing of beats and all these things that we were, you know, trying to keep in our minds. And I'd call it the soft bolting. I remember Stephen looking at it like, dude, that's a cool title. I was like, I know that is, you know. But at the time, you know, it was written as the soft bullet in. And, and he saw it as both. And I was like, yeah, that is cool. The very first four track I did of it was in the summer of 92 and it sounded like a really cheap Dinosaur Jr. song from, it sounded like something from You're Living All Over Me. And I was like, wow. <laughs> right, you can imagine that, right? That's how it started out. And I remember playing, I think I played it for Wayne. He was like, yeah, it sounds like Dinosaur Jr. right now. And then a couple years later, I was like, I've got this song and I had some slightly different instrumentation for it. He's like, yeah, it sounds like a car commercial or something. I'm like, oh, okay, right. So then I come back like uh, the end of 96, and I'm like, I've got this song. <laughs> and it's got two parts. It's got a big part that's got strings, and it's got this really soft part that sounds like it could be a Carpenter song, but it just needs some cool lyrics. And that's finally I got him kind of got it in his head, you know, because sometimes I'll have to work an idea. I'll have to present an idea to him like three or four in three or four different guises before he finally was like, oh, that's cool. What is that? You know. He made the demo where he did the, you know, he fucked with the tape player, and he made that little, which still, you know, when you hear that, people who know music, they're like, that, that's not, you're not doing that with the pitch thing, and you know, you can't really do that on a piano or these things. How are you doing that? And it's like, I, I don't know. Actually, it's difficult. We can't really even redo it ourselves. I think we actually took some of his four track for some of that as one of the layers. I mean, it's, mul it's a multiple layered sound, which seemed crazy at the time. Like, you're going to take something off a cassette deck and turn that into the basis of your song on your in your studio? That's what you're going to do? And when that's almost what we do every single time now. But um, at the time, it was, what? You, you should be fired as an engineer. What are you, what are you even considering doing this for? So we had this great beginning of the song, and then little by little we just didn't know how to do the rest of the song, which is supposed to be this very emotional, you know, singer-songwriter, you know, sort of song underneath there. And these big rock drums just didn't work, and the orchestration didn't work. 
And then I remember hearing a, I forget which Beck song. Was it Beck? I don't know. It was a great, it was a great Beck cut up masterpiece where it's this drum kit for a while and he's rapping and the whole production changes and he's rapping over a different sort of soundscape, you know. I remember thinking, why don't we do that but actually really play and make our own recording of that. So for Race to the Prize, we had the big kit that plays in the main parts. And then when it goes to the verse, the drums really quiet down. And, and so we called that the Fleetwood Mac Eagles kit for the soft parts of the song. And that was done in a small room at Dave's studio with a lot of towels on all the drums and duct tape and you know what I mean? And I would just barely play, you know, it's super like, you know, early coked out 70s drum style, you know? And then the big open part was, you know, the John Bonham sounded thing with, you know, it was like two mics, you know? So it's just a big wide open sound. When he played his drum beat over this orchestration orchestrated version of that and maybe again it was just it hit me at the right time that it felt like wow this is this is like the opening of you know a big you know epic you know movie or something or a tv show you know where they're going to give out you know i don't know awards for this yeah i don't know you know the cleanest teeth in america da, 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 da. I remember when we first started playing Race for the Prize for people, and they were like, this is wrong, right? Yet this is a joke, because my, my stereo sounds like it's broken. And people couldn't believe that we were saying, no, it's done. This is the finished song. Just humans with wives and children. And I remember singing that line, you know, they're just humans with wives and children. And I could almost see everybody that I would play that for just be like, dude, you got to bring the kids into it. Oh my God. You know, and so it, it would have this emotional thing about it. This is Wayne's handwritten video treatment for Race for the Prize. Two men wearing runners' outfits, shorts, t-shirts, numbers on their chest are sprinting at full agonizing speed as if something from the Olympics. I was going back to the Olympics of 1969, I believe. And there would be these epic, epic things of like the, you know, the, the marathons and, and there was probably some wicked music that they were even playing. And so I think, to me, I was just evoking some, you know, some punk rock futuristic version of that stuff, you know. And then the ridiculous Wizard of Oz looking goofy band playing tubas and stuff. Again, it's like, well, we're not gonna play guitars. You know, it was, I mean, we kept in that idea that we're not a rock band. You know, I could be holding a trumpet and not really even play it. I mean, it could just be anything. People ask me about that all the time. It's like, why, why did you think of that? And though they were sad, they rescued everyone. You know, you can't write a song and use that as a line thinking that you're writing a song. You kind of just have to think, well, there's a song. I got to write a song, but I got to start to say something. And usually you'll say something that is like somewhere within you that you know isn't a lyric, but you want to say it. The limits now are not I remember we'd sent Spoonful Always a ton to some people at Warner Brothers and you know we got a lot of phone calls back like man you know those vocals just sound like shit you know what's what's that singing he's doing? I mean there'd be these epic moments where I mean we'd come home and play them for people I think a lot of people would just be confused like what are you doing? This is <laughs> why are you making music like this? I mean because in the beginning a lot of it was very lo-fi and we would just really be you know we'd, we'd be so proud of this strange little emotional thing that we did, which was not about heavy drums and heavy guitars and stuff. We were dying to put like giant distorted guitars on this in the chorus, you know, how, how can you not? But instead we have clean flangey or chorusy guitars, you know, and that was, that was a, that was a stretch, you know, it was, it was hard to resist that temptation.
There's no electric bass guitar on that song, you know? It's all synth bass stuff, you know? I would play that, so. I think Michael started to feel like, well, what the fuck am I doing, you know? And I think just by his own um, wherewithal, he decided to just become more of a, to have more of a hand in the engineering and the production part of the process. I'd always been involved with the more technical, more technical side of everything. And then just that we wanted to start doing things quicker because Steven being the catalyst to that was so fast at doing stuff like, here's an idea, I hope you don't like that one, and you, you here's another one, and you'd have to be quick. We used to do parts by committee, we call it, where I would sit at the keyboard, and there's me at the keyboard, there's Dave, Wayne, and Michael all sitting there, and I'm playing, and as I'm playing, they're like, yeah, yeah, or, uh, or yeah, or no, no, don't do that, you know. <laughs> I was the only one of us that could think, you know, along, you know what I mean, with that kind of thinking and the change what I was playing or try a part really quickly. But one time he said, some part I put down for Spoon Boys that doesn't sound like John Tesh. <laughs> so like, it sounds like John Tesh. And I was like, fuck, <laughs> abort. Yelling as hard as they can, the doubters all were stunned. You know, you can't just write a song because you're sad. You can't just do it because something happened to you. So I think I always looked at it like, um, that's the kind of music that we should make. So I think once we got a taste of that, which we'd never had previously, you know, we were playing, you know, she don't use jelly, you know, I mean, all that stuff is fun, but it doesn't, it doesn't, de you know, demand or, 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 or have that same connection as a song like Superman or Spoonful Ways a Ton or Race for the Prize where, you know, someone has invested, this is their song and you're singing about their life and their, their identity and everything now, you know. Mostly what I remember about the Spider Ride song is the cool machine we had when we made it. We had uh, this Alessis 8-track digital recorder, which we were testing out, demoing at the time, and um, you could scrub audio on it. So that's that sound. You know, he just played that um, like that, but yeah, we we just sped it up. And we had to record ourselves doing this over and over and sample it and put it in where we wanted to do all this stuff. That was the big, you know, fun technological element of it for us, for, for, for me. But that was, you know, this is the, the world I live in. It's a sad song about insect bites, car crashes, and love that can still work out. It's a strange song. You know, that there's these elements where, where each verse was about a different real life story. Uh, and Stephen getting bit by a spider and then to just lyrically tell the story in, in such plain spoken manner that, you know, here's my friend Stephen who's in the band, he got bit by a spider and the doctors were gonna cut off his hand. And then Michael, you know, showing up with his story of, of the he was driving along with his uh, wife, Catherine, and um, another car drove by them. Their wheel came off and then hit their, their windshield. And he was like, you just can't believe this. And for Wayne to make a song incorporating these, these stories, it, it almost felt naive in a sense. You know, if you try to write a song that makes you not look like some, you know, self-indulgent, narcissistic asshole, you just can't do it, you know? So, so for me, you just sing, yeah, you know, I don't want you to die because I'd be sad and, you know, it's not about you, it's about me. You know, to hear that song, I always thought it was cool just to, you know, hear that, boy, if you weren't here, you would be missed. When you got that spider bite on your head Here's, here it is right here. Here's the bite in question. I, I thought that I'd been bitten by a spider. So I go to the emergency room in Norman, Oklahoma, and I tell them, I think I've been bit by a spider. And they're like, okay, well, it looks like it could be. So we'll give you these antibiotics and da 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 da. 
and took the antibiotics for a few days, but I didn't finish the antibiotics program. This is a lesson to everyone. They give you antibiotics for 10 days, fucking take them for 10 days because I stopped taking them like a day before I was supposed to finish. And within like 16 hours, my hand had blown up like the size of a softball. I mean, it was crazy. And he comes back and he's got this horrible thing in his hand. He said he got bit by a spider and went to the emergency clinic and they said he was gonna have to, you know, the only thing they could do at this point would just be to cut his hand off, otherwise, the poison, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, the good thing we didn't just do that. To be honest, the brown recluse, commonly known as the fiddleback here in Oklahoma, bite is so common that it just didn't register to me. I guess, once again, I was just naive. I really thought it was a spider bite. And, uh, and when I started talking to the doctor and told him what all had happened, he said, well, are you an IV drug user? And he knew what was going on. And I was like, well, yeah, I am. He's like, well, do you ever inject in your hand? I'm like, well, I, I have there before. He's like, well, don't you think that's probably what it is? Because it's not, you know, judging from what has happened in this course of events, it's not a spider bite, you know, so. But when it first happened, I thought it was. And so I told everybody, it's a spider bite. And so Wayne, on his sweet side, goes and writes this song. And I'm just like, Jesus, now he's written this song, you know, which is really, you know, it's just so nice, and you know, I can't tell him. I was glad that it didn't destroy you. How sad that would Steven waking up after a long night. <laughs> Cause if it destroyed you, it would destroy me. It was only later, you know, we'd, we'd recorded the song and everything, and he asked me, and he's like, that. Fucking, was that really a spider bite or what, you know? He just called me out and I was like, no, it wasn't spider bite, it was, you know, da da da. He's like, all right, we'll just keep it between us, you know, no one has to know. But it wasn't, any, you know, it wasn't like I was maliciously lying to him. I was, I was just so ashamed and embarrassed, you know, I wouldn't tell anybody. Okay, I mean, to me now it's funny that we all played along with this charade enough that we actually wrote a song about it and people believe the song and we would tell the story. I still tell the story now standing in front of 10,000 people, Stephen got this spider bite on his hand. Shooting a new video, and uh, it's for our song, Waiting for Superman, which is off the soft bulletin, the new Flameless record. And basically, uh, the Superman song, if you haven't heard it, it's Whatever, it's a song about, uh, I don't want to get too much into it, but it kind of has a depressing, melancholy sort of uh, trip to it and kind of drives home the point of basically we're all fucked and things aren't going to get much better, so you might as well try to make the best of it. Remember I came home, I was just strumming the guitar one day and that melody just sort of popped out. And so I put it on my four track and I played it a few times and didn't think too much about it. So I thought, well, I changed the key, so I changed it from A to B flat, and I started playing on the piano, and then it became this whole thing to me. It seemed a lot heavier or something, you know? And it just could go any way. It could be some little ambient piece of music that, you know. But if you put the right lyrics to it, it becomes this whole other thing, and that's what he did, you know? I don't think I could ever purposely think that I'm gonna do a song that begins with a line, I asked you a question and I didn't actually need you to reply. You know, when I, when I talk about that song now, I realize, oh wow, you know, I, had, I just had to say these things somewhere in there. I remember him saying to me, he's like, well, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna step out a little bit and, and just uh, let my guard down and try to, you know, not that you've ever felt that you have really had much of a guard, but. He really let his guard down and just was kind of honest about how he was feeling about life things or, you know, the serious stuff. My dad had this very quick, horrible, you know, cancer. And in the beginning of that, you know, you're, you know, you just don't know what, you don't know what's gonna happen. You, you can look ahead and think, well, perhaps he's gonna die, but you don't even think, it, that it's just him that's gonna die, it's this whole family unit, this whole idea of this family that has never, you know, we don't know what it's gonna be like for someone to die. How's your mother gonna be? How's my older brother's gonna be? They all struggled with drugs and stuff. And so 
everything just, it was all happening for the first time. And, and, and I think the soft bulletin has this in it as well. This, there's this idea that you're pushing ahead in your life as curious as ever. And I think you get up to a point in your life where you're starting to say, ooh, I think we're, it's like coming up on a bad accident. You know, I think we might see some stuff that we don't want to see, but we don't have a choice and we have to go. People who have family members die will come to me almost every show, you know, and they talk about Superman and they talk about Spoonful Ways a Ton and how it's like, I know what you're talking about. Yet we can't really specifically say what it is. And so we use music and we use these ways of, of, of speaking about it. I just remember being so relieved and happy that he didn't write a song about like giraffes or something, you know, or some fucking spaceman that, you know, was in the spider web. <laughs> I was just so glad that he had these lyrics that you, you hear him sung with those melodies. I was like, man, this is really something, you know? And that was it. I mean, we recorded the song. I, and I almost don't want to say because it, it sounds so hokey. You know, I was going through a lot of stuff at the time. I, I remember hearing the final mix, I started crying a little bit, you know? Just thinking, this is just a different, different realm for us. You know, this is a different. Uh, not that it wouldn't be taken seriously, but it kind of had that. To me, it had that feeling. I feel like the first three or four songs we did on the Soft Bulletin, we really, I hate to say this, but kind of blew our wad. Like, man, we gotta try all this stuff, you know? I feel like by the time we got to um, Feel Yourself Disintegrate, we tried all that stuff and some of it worked and some of it hadn't worked and we'd pull the reins a little bit and we just kind of stepped back a little bit. And so to me that felt like all the stuff we had learned that felt like we didn't have to use it now. We were just gonna use what we really thought worked for the song. It cracked the soft Bolton because there's an acoustic guitar in it. I mean, up until then, you know, it would always be like, it was my secret that I'd be like, we can't use an acoustic guitar. I don't want to do that kind of music, you know? And then when we started to do Feeling Yourself Disintegrate, I was using the acoustic guitar and they were like, well, what happened? You know, what happened to the rule? And I was like, well, I broke the rule, you know? <laughs> I remember, you know, he, he put down the acoustic guitar and sang, and I did that real soft drum track that seemed, I think it suits it really well, you know. And Michael, man, he just man, came up with this just flowing bass line, you know. You know, that bass line just makes the whole song just constantly move. But I think it really, in some ways, sums up what really was going on while the record was being made, you know, with Wayne's dad, going through his illness and then, you know, passing away and that whole idea of, you know, I, I don't know if, if that in particular is what cancer's like or if death itself is like that or the process of getting over that hump as you get older and you just are starting to slowly fall apart like an old car. I, and I say this a lot, but I do think writing songs, it's just, that's what you do. There's elements of the world and your life and the way that we have to exist that you just can't control it. And so you sing songs about it. Once that song got recorded and mixed, uh, we, we put it on the boom box out on the porch and we all sort of wandered off into the woods for some reason. I, there was a hammock out there at the time. I remember laying in the hammock, just listening. It was dark, it was night, you know. 
like as the as, as it's fading out, we're like it's gonna be okay. This is gonna work. I remember calling Scott and saying, we we have something now. I felt like that was sort of bound the whole record together. And then we decided that would go into Sleeping on the Roof. And to me, those two together are just like, man, it's just a perfect way to end a record, you know? One, two, three, four. I remember um, we met one morning. I was probably drinking coffee and he was probably smoking cigarettes. And he drew out on a piece of paper um, a musical staff with lines and and he turned it upside down and we, we thought we would try this experiment where he would just randomly draw these dots on the musical staff. And then when he turned it back right side up, whatever those notes were would be the theme of this abstract composition. We wanted to originally release that as a separate like EP thing that was gonna be 30 or 40 minutes of just that piece of music in it. Almost like a you know ambient piece or something. But that's how that came about. And then we just recreated it at Dave's. Follow the numbers on here. We just count down through the numbers. You get the, the theme for sleeping on the roof. And really the way it should end is sleeping on the roof. It should, that should be the last thing you hear on the record, you know. But on the UK version, you get the remixes at the very end. So you get sleeping on the roof, that's over. And then Race for the Prize and Superman, finish it off, you know. I wish it just ended with sleeping on the roof. And I think at some point that'll, that will be the version, you know. Plus the UK version has slow motion. And America has, is it bugging in and a spider bite, so. Really, it feels like all three of those songs should be on the record. So maybe at some point that would be the release, you know? LSD, the exploding threat of the mind drug that got out of control. <laughs> all right. Typical Wayne, I mean, he he's always so visual. And I remember him bringing me this Time Life book with this photo in it. I actually didn't know it was about LSD, but I just liked this idea that this guy was, you know, he was like, like seeing in himself, you know, he was seeing another version of himself or something, you know. I think the way we processed it and made it even more of a kind of graphic, simple thing is even more powerful than that. I don't know what it is. I, th I think it's, it, it, it goes into the realm of just unspeakable things. And that's why we have music and, and images, because there's like these, these cracks in our reasoning that we just, we can't speak about it. But I remember when I felt like we finally made the music that is that cover. And there's, there's these long passages in the middle of suddenly everything has changed. And Stephen, it's one of these things that Stephen just did. He's like, it's like the first time he played it, he just played these weird melodies that are in, they're not really in time, but they're in like human time where they just go. And I remember hearing it and I was like, yes, that's, that's what it sounds like to me. So, you know, I, I think I was always trying to make music that if you saw that cover and heard pieces of this record, it would just be, you'd never, you know, you'd never forget that. Shape. 
I, I know, especially on the, hot on the heels of that hit breaking, uh, hit making uh, Zyreka record, uh, we knew, we all felt, although we felt strongly about the material and that we had made this, you know, possibly the best record we had made, um, we all, we literally shook each other's hands at the door and said, well, that might have been the last one. We thought maybe the record would come out, even though I secretly thought Race of the Prize was going to be a big international hit. Um, I think we also thought that the record would come out and go, dip, dip, gone, you know. It would get some small review in Rolling Stone, and and people would, would forget about it, and we'd get dropped from the label, and that'd be it, you know. You know, as that year went after it came out, you know, you, you started to feel like, hey, man, I think people really like it. I, and, you know, and then it, it kept going and kept going. And, man, we were really surprised with, you know, we saw at the end, end of 99, it was all these, all these lists, and, you know, a lot of people saying it was one of the best records of the year, and it just gave us a whole new life, you know. I can't describe what it is that it is that touches people. I was moved in the same way while creating it, you know. Uh, it was, it was, I think those songs are really cool. I think they sound cool. I'm, I'm glad I was there when it happened, you know. The Soft Bulletin now, when, when I hear it now, it really is about despair. But, but the, you know, there's no despair in it. And what I mean by that, I think sometimes, you know, you think you want to sing about despair. But I don't think it's like that. I think it's being in despair and singing. You know, when you're in despair, you think, oh, I'm fine. You know, everything's good. Look, the sun's coming up. Look at that. Isn't it great? And I think, <laughs> I think that's what the Soft Bulletin is doing. It's, it's, it's realizing this despair isn't something that we're singing about. It's us. And then we have to sing about you know, lifting up the sun and, you know, waiting for a Superman, you know. And we always sing as though it's not us, you know. And we know, you know, that's all you can do is sing about your dumb, you know, your, your dumb struggle. It's definitely a, a journey of some kind. Uh, I, I think that's what the I think that's what the soft bulletin really was all about, and you know, we came out the other end of that. Even though it was a big jump forward, it felt, I felt completely comfortable with all of it. I was just I was really happy about it. You know, it was the first Lips record that I played for everyone in my family. Everyone talks about it being a sad record, but I I don't think of it as a sad record. I think of it as, as a record where you're just thinking about life, you know, and, and death is part of life. You know, it's a, it's a dilemma of, you know, it's a beautiful, wicked, wonderful world. Is it? <laughs>